Welcome back inside brunch from now until 12 o'clock. We may go beyond 12 o'clock this morning a bit as uh, we try to accommodate all our guests. Uh, the PM and the first 90 days is the thrust of our conversation this morning. I cannot, however, get there, oblivious of the road signs that are begging some adherence to them. Uh, we started our conversation in the area of school violence. Uh, my next guest has a university. She, at university, she was a teacher. She was also a secondary school teacher, so she's got that backdrop in addition to being a Caribbean writer, a lecturer, and a researcher. I cannot jump into my 90 days or some of the signs I see on the side of the road without saying, Rhoda Barrett, first of all, welcome. Thank you very much, Reni. Thank you for having me here, and good morning to your listeners. It is a good morning to you, and the, the privilege is all ours. Uh, you've been making a wonderful noise, which is very encouraging. Uh, it is a compliment. Um, but, uh, but, but, but we've been talking about the spike in violence. The tutor president who was with us earlier said, this is nothing new. It's been going on for a while. Folks are now making a deal of it, but social media is merely bringing to the fore what we know. That's one. And my question to you as a second a former secondary school teacher and, and a teacher at the university. Speak to this violence we are seeing here. Is there a misunderstanding at what is propelling this, or is this something, uh, let's just say, a storm uh, in a proverbial teacup? It's not a storm in a teacup. Uh, the storm got out of the teacup a long time ago. Children are angry, upset, and disenfranchised. Whether they are kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, you, what you are seeing right now are... Um, thanks to social media, because I don't think it. I don't think we have more fights. You know, mm. I don't think that um, fighting amongst teenagers are necessary is necessarily on the rise per se. Um, this is something that you we I, certainly I have been seeing um, consistently for the last fifteen to twenty years. I you know I started teaching in two thousand and one. Um, at both the secondary and tertiary level, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing a I'm not seeing a marked increase in 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 fights per se. What I'm seeing a marked increase in is frustration and um, just you know necessary uh, students, um, young people not being able to express the things that are hurting them. So the question we have to ask now is not um, why are we seeing more fights. What we have to ask ourselves is. Why are these? Why are children so angry? What's causing them to be so angry and so frustrated? And it, nobody gets angry and frustrated in a vacuum. Would you at least concede that the level of impunity in which it is being done now um, has indeed escalated? I mean, I see a police officer walking in there, and, and, and folks going about it as though he's not there. I, I see adults on the I street don't, supporters I don't, stepping in. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know um, that impunity is the word that I would use. I think that children children don't care anymore because adults don't have their respect, mm. and there's a reason adults don't have their respect. I mean, you just have to look around at what happens from the highest office in the land, go all the way down. If there's no ret if there's no retribution from the top, go down when mm -hmm. people do wrong things. Why should children start respecting us and thinking that we have any sort of moral authority to come down on them? Mm -hmm. So I think that what you're seeing now is if 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 teenagers, if young people think that police officers are corrupt, if in the communities and societies they're growing up in, they are seeing corrupt police officers moving moving about in the society. If they are not no longer seeing police officers as um, authoritarian figures or authority figures, if they're seeing police officers now as bullies, r more so than law enforcement, mm. right? If they're seeing their teachers as well as either unempowered as well or, or bullies as well, then eventually what is going to take place is a situation where we have no respect for you. We don't have to listen to you. We're not going to take you on. And honestly... If you're in a fight, Rennie, let's say both you, you and I got into a fight here about something and, and the police officer came into the room, you know, your, your assistant here managed to call the police, police officer. If you and I in the heat of the fight, we fighting with each other. People, the police officer going to have to drag us off each other, you know, mm. so... Actually, you I mean, I saw. You I fight saw more the, passionately than I do. Yes. I? <laughs> well, then I guess he will have to drag me off you. Um, no, the thing is, I saw the video of the fight, the, the most recent one, and I've seen videos of of other fights, some that make it um, viral on Facebook, and others that don't. Mm -hmm. And in all situations, you are seeing young people that don't know how to articulate their resentment or anger or rage any other way than physically. Disenfranchised is yes. what you said. Explain, please. They don't feel that they've got power. 
they feel very unempowered and when they and when when that feeling overwhelms them they lash out if you're not learning in homes how to deal with anger and how to deal with conflict or rather if the only way you're being taught in your homes or in the communities and societies that you're in so that could be home and school right home church school all of those places if you're not learning any other way to deal with anger resentment frustration other than lashing out that's what you're going to do how much that has to do with the the educating of the parents themselves who are for the most part very young folks who are just still discovering I themselves. think that that's one of the areas that we're falling short in in other parts of the world you have um, well certainly in, in societies that I think are a little bit more advanced than ours you've got programs now wherein young parents or young parents within communities have to now take on board you know they have to do parenting sessions and the ways in which you're able to assess whether or not those parenting sessions with them on weekends are working is you get to assess the, their children mm -hmm. to see whether or not the things that the parents have been taught are now being manifested in the behavior of the children and i think we have um we have a really good opportunity here we have a lot of young er, um the the early childhood care centers now mm -hmm. Parents have to put their children into kindergarten now. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's rare that you have parents that that can that that can afford to not put their children into kindergarten because mm -hmm. we are everybody's working, right? Um, you have a situation now where you can you you can b get those parents on board from very early and say, okay, all right, your child is part of our ECC um, e center. One of the things that you have to do if your child is going to be here is commit to, let's say, a 90-minute parenting workshop session mm -hmm. every weekend, right? And in that session, you teach the parents things that they've got to impart onto the children. And so that way, we can start to tackle things from the very youngest generation come up. We are all stakeholders in this. Is we this are. is this something that begs of the uh, of private enterprise to start looking at ways to have where there is uh, a sizable uh, percentage of, of mothers working in their uh, in their establishment? Yes, uh, some of these classes can in fact be uh, introduced. Can, it can be introduced right to the workplace. Not listen, yes, private, the workplace, yes. pri private enterprise here really and truly has got to be one of the most worthless citizens we have. You know. There's a sense in which they don't re they, they're very hands off about mm -hmm. their responsibility and role with the community. So does that mean that this radio station is going to incorporate something like that? I'm just asking. Well, uh, Mr. Chow, for a long time, even before I got here, mm -hmm. uh, made a priority not in just words but in policy to ensure that uh, family time is accommodated here, is facilitated here. Great, and, Great. Uh, and, and And that has been a, a priority I've met here, so uh, touche that takes care of that. Let us continue. <laughs> uh, Rhoda Barrett, who is hitting shots at she goes, <laughs> uh, Caribbean writer, lecturer, and researcher. We're very happy to have her here. Uh, in, in, in the first instance, we're talking about uh, all the stakeholders coming together. Speak to, just briefly, the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Education and their understanding of what is going on there is a big difference in being present and being relevant and a, a, a lot of these institutions we find they are in fact present but not relevant you want you want me to speak briefly about the ministry of education i want that you could to take hours but I let, want me, you to let me continue jump in. doing it as <laughs> modestly as you have <laughs> as guarded as you let have. me let me let me jump into it as quickly as i possibly can then i've got concerns about how relevant the current minister of education is to the 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 the, the current education climate Mm. Right. I've heard comments uh, like we need to bring religion into school, but not bring sex education into schools. And we've got, you know, such a high prevalence of sexual activity mm -hmm. and, and teen pregnancies in the country. And we continue to believe that we have that we're going to act as if young people don't have sex. Young people have sex. Young mm -hmm. people have lots mm -hmm. of sex and they're not necessarily doing it responsibly. Um uh, I've also heard about bringing corporal punishment back into schools as if we're not violent mm. enough a, a society already. And this whole idea that beating children is what helps them to understand when things are wrong. Mm -hmm. I've found in my personal experience as an educator that the more I talk to and reason with children, that's when they begin to understand where they're erring where they're, where they're doing wrong and how they need to do things better or, ne or need to do things differently. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with corporal punishment if only because I don't think if I hit an adult it's going to make a difference. So why would hitting a child make a difference in terms of behavior? 
you already made your point about the ostriches <laughs> in institutions. I do want to ask you this then. In the case of, of the climate that we have here now, how in the short term, and in the short term, I'm not asking for a panacea. I understand this is incremental. I understand it is policy driven. A lot of things must change. In the short term, how do we get some sense, in, in, in your opinion, uh, of control over our situation. The president of Tutor said, for instance, which we know, we need more counselors in the school. We don't see folks doing that. All right, you are an advocate um, for many things. How do we go about giving the sense of urgency to the ministry and getting something done, getting money allocated and getting people in place to, 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 to have a pool of counselors, let's say, that you can call on? Unfortunately, we are, we are a reactive country. We're not a proactive mm. country. So our, I think our mm. ministry of education and perhaps even the minister of education may only respond if there are spurt of fights. But Rhonda, and then everybody, everybody flares up on, on Facebook and Twitter for a couple of weeks. But what I would like to see, mm -hmm. um, that organization that you just had here, the National PTA, mm -hmm. I think they need to be um, functioning far more, far more proactively. Mm -hmm. Getting parents, right? Because the parents are, parents are huge stakeholders here. Yes, indeed. Right? Get the parents who are voters, because they're all over 18, hopefully, right? Get the parents to put pressure on the government mm -hmm. and you've got you've got multiple ministries that need to get on board here yes right yes you've got um cherry ann critchlow coburn's ministry mm -hmm. you've got an uh, anthony garcia's ministry you've got nyan gadsby dolly's ministry those are three main mi ministries that i see being part and parcel of uh, a, a thrust to getting us out of the morass that we're in where where it comes to um, education, because I'm not looking at education here only in the formal 8, 10 to 2.30 mm -hmm. or, or, or 8 to 3 p.m. Um, format. I'm looking at education in an overall holistic sort of way. My guest is Rhoda Barrett, and uh, we uh, just used that bridge to link off our earlier conversation because of her expertise. She is a former secondary school and university uh, teacher. She's also a Caribbean writer. She is a lecturer. She is a researcher. She is a blogger. And some folks, depending on uh, um, you know, what glasses you put on, call her troublemaker. <laughs> Rhoda, I said uh, we cannot get to the first 90 days of the PNM without looking at some of the signs along the highway that beg our attention. One of them came up last night. It was the result of the UNC internal elections. Political analysts, take that cap on for me. Let's talk about that. Um, were you surprised uh, that Kamala Prasad Bessessa retained uh, no. her position as leader? No? Not in the slightest. Uh, very early on. I mean, as recently as, um, what is it, Thursday? Thursday morning going. Um, another radio station had asked me my thoughts and they wondered if I would, you know, I, if I didn't want to call it too early. And I said, no, she's going to win. Mm. Um, and she's going to win if only because um, she controls the party and therefore controls the electoral list, right? Which the, is the same thing Mr. Pandey said. Right, when mm -hmm. she controls mm -hmm. the voter mm -hmm. list. I mean, and let's, let's not... Let's not overlook the fact that this is a country where lots of things can be controlled and rigged and whatever other words you want to use. Um, so I didn't expect her to not win. Um, what, what I was looking for more mm -hmm. than anything else was the turnout for the vote. We don't have final figures yet, and I've been getting, I've been getting um, uh, contradictory, contradictory reports about what went on in terms of the turnout. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at, that's, what, that's the thing I want to wait on, the final figures. Because depending on how many votes she won by, if she won by less mm -hmm. votes this year than she won by in 2010, um, because the last set of figures I got last night, she, it was about like 3,000 and something mm. votes that she won by. That is 11,000 less votes than she would have gotten in, ten, in 2010. But you mentioned earlier that she claimed she had a, a higher, yes, higher voter turnout. Yes, yeah, some, someone else said to me that uh, mm. from, from within the, the UNC hole that, that she says that she won by, that she said that she won by 20,000 votes. So I'm not, I'm not sure and I'm waiting. Not that she garnered 20,000 votes, but she won by yes, that 20, she won, Yeah, that she won by 20,000 votes, which Give me <laughs> if that is the case, then I have to say that, you know, the party really and truly is, is vibrant and energetic. 
like the be- end of uh, the end of Bharat and the end of Monilal. Uh, you believe that is yeah, true? Yeah, I think I think so. Even though I, I I've heard I've, I've heard yeah I've heard her say that um, mm. she's willing to work with anybody. I think what happens she's aware now that it was a very imprudent statement to have made two weeks ago that I'm not willing to work with this one. I'm not willing to work with that one. I I don't understand how how anybody who is putting himself or herself forward as a leader can say that. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay, so so she's one now, and so you know she's in a in a conciliatory mood, well, and I think that's window dressing. That is well, um, uh, uh, well, window dressing. Either that, or there is growth. I mean, it, it is the same person who found it um, not appropriate to show up at the party's headquarters. The same person who found it not uh, appropriate to congratulate the winner of a national election. And if in fact she says, "Hey, you're welcome," well, at least there is growth. PR. Um, it is growth. Who said that? <laughs> it's uh, t- thirty. 30 minutes after 11, Rhoda Barat is my guest. So um, the leader remains the leader of the UNC. And uh, I, I take you kind of, um, my favorite Eric Williams word, plenipotentiary at large, because you <laughs> seem to be just about everywhere. Uh, and I go into the area of the of the appeal court ruling. Uh, the chief justice, who I agree with, he said, and this is dissenting opinion, that if, um, in fact, the hour affected anybody, it should be everybody, which is to say the 39 constituencies uh, would have been um, wronged by this. It is That is the basis on which he said, hey, I cannot see why you choose six marginal seats. Do you agree with the decision and the um, offering of the, of the Chief Justice? And what do you think would be the outcome of this challenge? First thing, w- w- I'm in agreement with what Justice um, Chief Justice Ivarchi has said. It, as a matter of fact, the minute that they had um, started talking about challenging the il- the election results, my thing was, well, it has to be in all 39 seats mm-hmm. because that extra hour affected all 39 seats. Right. So even the seats that the UNC won by slim margins, for instance, like Samoa Barataria, that seat should be up for it should it should be questioned as well, mm-hmm. right? Because there's a possibility that maybe. Hafiz Mohammed won that seat as opposed to Fuad Khan, right? As a for example. Um, n- number one, I'm not sure how exactly the the UNC is going to prove that it won the election by 6 p.m. Because that's what that's what happens. It's two things really that, that, that this petition is saying. It is saying one that the EBC went outside of its remit of, of, of um power, that mm-hmm. the EBC um, has control of running an elections, yes, but they can't change the time of an election. That's one of the things. And then the other as- angle that you're looking at is whether or not that extra hour caused a material difference in terms of the outcome of the there election. Is a th- there's a third fact. Um, what's the third, what's the third um, fact? Uh, Ms. Yeah. Barrett, the third fact is who do you have in the EBC that's telling you the numbers <laughs> before we close the poll? Yeah, exactly. I mean, to make the statement that you were ahead. Well, it raises questions about the integrity of the EBC. Questions, yes. Re- it's very mm-hmm. serious questions because if you were saying that you knew at that point in time, then how did you know, mm-hmm. right? How do mm-hmm. you know what was going on with the with the with the the, bol- the polling and the ballots? Because if we're going with the whole business of voting being something that is in co- that people, you know, it it is invisible. You, you nobody knows who you voted for. Mm-hmm. Are you therefore then saying that you what, are you assuming these people voted for you, or is it that you know for certain these people voted for you? And if that is the case, how do you know for certain these people voted for you? So mm-hmm. those are the questions that are being raised right now. I guess a magistrate is going to have to call a meeting to say, okay, this is how the trial is going to go. You have to submit evidence by this point in time, blah, 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 blah. So I'm waiting to see the outcome of it. I think it's an <laughs> exercise in... Futility. Is really in you, right. Yeah. And, 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 and I also think it is an ex- exercise. But the positive side of it, ap- apart from it being an exercise in futility, the positive side of, of, of this exercise is that it allows us people who are interested in how a constitution works and how the, how, how the various um, bodies of the state or institutions of the state work, it will allow us the opportunity as in the course of the trial to look at our constitution and to look at the EBC and to ask questions about the constitution and the powers of the EBC. It begs of us too as a nation to get beyond the headline awareness of yes. issues because the varied interpretations of the court decision, I wonder is it good politics, internal electioneering or just ignorance that puts into the public domain the the, the impression that the court, uh, the appeal court decision uh, uh, validated a a charge of impropriety. I mean, I'm I'm wondering, uh, uh, people 
misunderstanding this with good heart, or you just don't have a clue? Well, one of, like, one of the... I mean, um, they said let the case go forward. They never validated anything. But, Rennie Bishop, let me ask you this question. Who, which columnist do we have right now actively engages with legal matters and legal issues and breaks it down for the population? Mm. Dana Sitahal was the last person that was doing that for us. That's the... It's the thing that I miss the most about her... Ha- mm. about, about her not being here anymore because you knew if a legal an important m- legal matter that um that impacted on the public if that came forward she would write about it they put your pot on fire there would be a, a, a column about it that saturday and you would be able to read about it the e- that ebc petition has been is since early september and i have yet to see somebody really take that and strip it down to its bare minimum in a newspaper column maybe it happened and i missed the column but I haven't. I, I. I. think that there's a sense in which perhaps the law association needs to step in and start doing a, a regular column or a regular show or something or the other, breaking down legal issues like this for us. Now you understand where, like um, Dr. Winford James, I went through hoops to find you to the extent that one of my contacts said he's after you. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason for that <laughs> is because we need to break these things we down. Do. We need to have we do. an understanding. The society of it. needs to understand that the, the, that nobody won anything. All mm-hmm. the court said was, "Okay, all right, this is something that is arguable," which is very different from winnable. Yes, right? It's yes. arguable, not necessarily winnable. So let's see if it's winnable. That's what's going to happen now. Mm. Waste of the court's time. Anyway, <laughs> oh, that's a different. <laughs> Uh, it is very uh, often said, it is very often said, be careful what you wish for. Mm-hmm. Let us, just for the sake of going through this script, I don't believe what I'm saying, but I'll raise it anyway. Um, for, the, uh, for, for, for the purpose of going through this script, that in fact the petition is found to be valid. Mm-hmm. And there is a by-election. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and many people are saying, be careful what you wish for because they will be devastated. Is that your feeling? That's my feeling. I think mm. that, um, I don't think that the UNC as it currently mm. stands is offering the country much. I don't even think that it, it, it is a powerful opposition. Mm. Um, so I don't think that it's going to be seen or perceived as a powerful government, as an alternative, a powerful alternative government. And... Every and in the last three months or so, because it's been it's almost three months since the um since the elections, mm-hmm. there are all of these rel- revelations um about what has what has gone on in terms of spending and the mismanagement of the economy, and right now the you know the country woke up on Friday morning to Joala finally coming around to telling us what some of us knew too. Um, economic quarters ago Indeed. that we are in a recession and you know people are I, I was at Macreep this morning there were lots of people discussing it on the beach and in the water and I thought to myself oh, how can a government you know regardless of regardless of how much you want to line your pockets mm-hmm. right how can you decide that you are going to be so irresponsible if you were to take what Mr. Ambert said as to what happened with the national gas uh, company and mm-hmm. the amount of money that was taken in cash mm-hmm. from them mm-hmm. uh, it's vulgar at the very least mm-hmm. and, and and it may come back to that point you made earlier kids in school are looking at what's happening from the upper and, and wondering well why should I pay attention to the rules when no rules are being followed mm-hmm. however you are here for the first 90 days mm-hmm. of the PNM that's my entree I've got to take you some business I'll come back with my guest Rhoda Barrett. We will talk about the PNM in the first 90 days, good, bad, or indifferent. Come back with that after this.